Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth. That is Derek Young. Reminder to uh, head over to K-State Online to get all of your K-State news and notes, whether it's basketball, which is in full swing, or football, which is always important and always a topic of discussion. All those places down below is where you can find K-State Online. Uh, so if you're not subscribed to the YouTube or our site over at On3, do so and uh, be a part of everything that's going on there. We are here today to talk to you about what everybody loves about K-State football. Really, I think K-State in general right now, that would be Avery Johnson. Avery Johnson is, I mean, you think about what K-State has going on. We just saw the football schedule for next season release. There's a lot of energy, excitement about what is going to happen. And we ended our show when the schedule came out discussing, like, what is the record for this team going to be? And you start to look around and you go, this thing's, this thing, K-State's going to have a lot of games where they're favored. Very few where they aren't the favorite. And at the end of the day, K-State's success next season, yes, there will be other parts of it that are important, but so much of it hinges on Avery Johnson being the quarterback, but still improving on what we saw this season and where expectations lie for him. So this is a pretty big question to ask, but it's a simple phrase, and that's what are the expectations for Avery Johnson in 2024? Yeah, you probably left it broad for, for a reason, too. Uh, look, with him, you have just such a dynamic athlete at quarterback. And a lot. there's actually a lot of unknown because we haven't gotten, besides the, really the Pop-Tarts Bowl, we haven't really got to see him you know, start to finish in a game with the full complement of a game plan built around him. And for a bowl game, it's the only time he got that. And the bowl game's still not like a – a real football game. It is, but it isn't, right? You have a lot of guys that sh- that are playing that probably wouldn't have been if there wasn't some, you know, transfers and opt outs and stuff of that nature. So, and then the other team is a little shorthanded as well. You're playing, you know, in a neutral site. Like it's it's not the same. So there is a lot of unknown. And now you added in the fact that you have a new quarterback coach and a new, basically two new offensive coordinators, right? So there is a lot of unknown, but I'll just say this ceiling of potential. And I know you were probably alluding to and touching on this. I'll just go from a win loss standpoint. Most years that, or maybe every year that we've covered K state, we've kind of looked at the schedule and there's a game. It's like, Oof, I don't know if they're ever going to get that one. Like I think I, now they almost got it, but I think everyone felt that way about at Texas last year yeah. because you knew how good they were going to be. Or in the years prior to that, especially when Lincoln Riley and Bob Stutz were still the coach, it was like, I don't know if we're going to get Oklahoma. Now, Chris Kleiman got Oklahoma more often than not. So, I mean, a lot of these things shake out a different way. But there is no and, – and, and I know it's probably disappointing for some people, and probably some people will look at it, the Big 12 as much more diminished because of it, and in a way it is. But – there is no team that you look on that schedule like you would Oklahoma and Texas that strikes fear in you the way that those two sometimes could. And the – what I mean, I, I should pull up the, the schedule, right, to, to kind of hammer my uh, point home. But the most talented team that Kansas State's going to play this year, just from a X's and O standpoint, is it Arizona? Is it even – it might be the non-conference game. Like I – that's that's where I'm at right now yeah. is that Kansas State, unlike other years in the past, and this is not even this might not even be the best Kansas State team that I've covered. Obviously, the team that won the Big 12 championship probably is, especially considering the the NFL, the pool of NFL draft talent that was on that roster at the same time and playing heavy snaps. But boy, uh Maybe Oklahoma State because they got you last year that you worry about that. Obviously, there's some road gains that are tricky because of venue, uh, dates, locations, all that stuff. But, yeah, I I don't even know now that I look at it. I think Arizona is definitely the most talented team they can't stay to play this year. I don't know that it's much of a question. So, again, and because you have a guy that's such an explosive playmaker at quarterback too, now he'll make his mistakes and there'll be some growing pains probably at the coordinator title as well. But boy, this, this team, 
I mean, if someone told you Kansas State beat so and so, all twelve of these teams. Now, if someone told you Kansas State was going to twelve and zero, you'd be pretty surprised. Yeah. But if you but if you sit in isolation, Kansas State's going to beat all what all twelve of those teams, and you just broke it up, they would not be surprised. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. And I we kind of hit on this uh, on Tuesday when the schedule came out, and we were talking about it. But this is just what life in the new Big Twelve will and should be like for K State, where they always have a really solid team where, you know, I think Chris Kleiman's gotten into where um, the end of Bill Snyder is like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to complain about a seven and five season, but now it feels like, you know, the, the floor for climbing, it's like eight and four in the regular season. That's, that's, that's the base right there. Like eight wins is as low as you want to go. Everything below that feels like a failure. And oh, now you're playing a schedule that, a lot of the teams at the top, they're just like K-State, where they are going to have their years where they really pop, and then they're going to have some years where they take a dip. And there are a lot of teams where they have not even had those years where they've popped within the last decade or more. And so you're going to start, I think, having to raise the bar of expectations, and the schedule will come out every year, and you'll go, okay, well, it feels like this team could be 10-2, and 11-1. Like, that is, that's not unrealistic to say. and. Look, Avery Johnson, you talk about the talent of like Arizona and if they're going to be the most talented team you play, I think if it's not them on K-State's schedule, it probably ends up being the home game against Kansas. But you have to talk about Avery Johnson as where does he stack up in terms of Big 12 quarterbacks now? Like we know Utah is bringing back Cam Rising for his 17th year. So, you know, he's been around for a while. And and as long as he's healthy, he's a stud. Yeah, which you're saying that about, um, I mean, other guys too, like Jalen Daniels. It, is he even going to be healthy enough to play next year? Who knows? But like there there are health concerns about some of the guys in the league and then others, you know, yeah. you, you think about like Fafita with Arizona. He was a freshman last year He's and he he played awesome football for them when he finally was the, the go-to guy, which started at like the end of September. Um, but I mean, Avery Johnson is in contention to be a top three or four quarterback in Probably this Big four. 12 that has 16 teams now. Probably four, and I think you mentioned them, right? It would be him. I would take Noah Fafita. Fafita might be my number one. Mm-hmm. Um, Jalen Daniels, as long as he's healthy, that's top four. And then who's the other one we said as long as healthy? Cam Rising. Cam Rising. Uh, those are the four, right? I don't think – now, I would say there's two – and then I'm only looking at the Kent State schedule, so I might be forgetting someone that they're not even playing. Oh, KJ Jefferson, UCF. Yep. Oh, yeah, oh. that's a good point. Yep, KJ Jefferson, UCF. So maybe those five, but there's two on the Kent State schedule. I'm like, you got to be at least pay attention to them. What is Rocco Becht? Like, I know we, we're all supposed to hate Iowa State and all that, but that dude had a really good freshman year at, at Iowa he did. State. And oh, that's a good point. And and another one. Now it's probably not fair because like Cam Rising, he's like forty five years old. But hell, hell, he, he went to the Big Twelve Championship game last year. Alan Bowman, I mean, I, I, you got to be leery of Alan Bowman because yeah, I'm not going to get I'm not going to give any air to that one for you. All he all he did last year was win, so that's I guess I got to give a little bit of oxygen to it. So he's the Brock Purdy of college football. He's got good scheme and good players around him and. And just because he won, we're supposed to act like he's and who's he's the BYU quarterback? Amazing. Didn't, didn't they sign a good transfer too? I think maybe. Not. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I can't remember who they yeah. they ended up with. But uh, look, I I think Avery Johnson. Obviously, he has the the ability to be the best quarterback in the Big Twelve next season. I think we know that. Yeah. It's just a matter of like a lot of guys, and, and we've we just got done talking about K State basketball, but it's about where your floor is and and trying to minimize how low the floor is for Avery Johnson I mean this is going to be his first real year as the guy we saw him play well in the pop Tarts bowl against NC State when he got it when he was the main guy against Texas Tech he came through did what you needed to but it's a whole different animal being the guy for 12 games and you know NC State fine team whatever they were without their best defensive player Texas Tech Ended up being a six and six team last season, so it he was the not out there when they faced Texas or against Oklahoma State or whoever. 
where should we expect the floor for Avery Johnson to be last year? Where like, oh yeah, he he kind of had an off game. What does an off game in 2024 look like? Because I think that tells us more about what Avery Johnson's 2024 is than his highs do. It's, it's interesting because blindly I would just go and say the floor is lower this year with Avery Johnson in comparison to what it was last year when he had an older quarterback who had already won a Big 12 championship and started a lot of football games. But you're ceiling. I think there are a lot of people that will disagree with you. <laughs> I, I, well, I'm about to disagree with myself. So, yeah, okay. Okay. don't worry. So, I, on blindly, you would say that because this guy's won a Big 12 championship and started a lot of football games. So, uh, Avery Johnson, who, doesn't, who has one college football started quarterback under his belt that wasn't even in a college football stadium, right? So, you, you have that. So, th- that's why blindly it would make sense that the floor would be lower but that the ceiling would be exceptionally higher just because his ceiling and what he can do on a football field is very much magnified because of his gifts. Um, but then I'll, I'll backtrack here and say, well, you would say that he, he has a much lower ceiling because he'll turn the ball over more. Avery Johnson did turn the ball over. I think he had a fumble. He never threw an interception. Now limited opportunities. Will Howard threw a, a good amount of interceptions last year. And he got got away with throwing a good amount more, um, especially thinking about the one that was dropped in the KU game that probably gives you an L in Lawrence, thanks to the Jayhawk that dropped that ball. So I don't know. They were they were kind of making those turnovers anyway. So now you do it with a a guy that has a much better chance of making a you know explosive play, yeah. something that Kansas State struggled with last year. So. No, I don't know. The, now, the Will Howard that they got at the end, tail end of 2022, I don't know that I expect that level of consistent dominance week after week for like five or six weeks in year one as a starting quarterback, but I think you'll see flashes and maybe not. And you might get a terrible performance, right, especially with two new offensive coordinators. But I just I, – I think – I just go back to last year not and feeling like the quarterback play just kind of underwhelmed. Mm-hmm. And I think that it can be better this year. Now, what does that look like? I don't know. Is there a little bit more inconsistency perhaps because he is so young? But, I mean, a lot of the – you got Jace Brown back. You got Keegan Johnson back. I mean, you, you didn't really lose a skill position player outside of Ben Sinnott that makes you really, you know, grind your teeth and say, oh, oh crap, we're, we're screwed. The, the one position I'd feel a little bit about that would be offensive line, which that's why it's going to be a main topic of the off season. But I will say it'll probably come down to that first month and a half because that's the toughest part of their schedule. And that's where he, he's going to be the least developed. I mean, yeah. by the time he gets to the second half of the season, he'll be a lot more comfortable and a lot better of a quarterback and the competition suffers. I mean, especially after the KU game. After the KU game, they play a three-game stretch against Houston, Arizona State, and Cincinnati, which I don't see them losing that. It's that six-game stretch before that, that, right, where you're at Tulane, home against Arizona, at BYU, home against Oklahoma State, at Colorado, at West Virginia, home against KU. Because the rest of the schedule doesn't – so that that would be the part that would scare me a little bit is – uh, you're going to get the lesser version of him at quarterback when you're playing the best teams on the schedule. Yeah, here's here's what I'll say on this and, and how I view this. Number one, like in terms of of what you'll get, think of, think of 2023. It does feel like so many times we would say after the losses for K State, man, you really want to crush the defense, but at the end of the day, they one did point. enough to give the opportunities for the offense to come through and. The offense didn't come through against Missouri to put the game away. Clearly, it was the offense that let them down in Stillwater. Um, even you know the loss in Austin, you could you could put that in there. And then we know uh, the offense the offense was not the problem in the uh, in the uh, the home game loss to Iowa State at the end of the year. <laughs> no, uh, we that, know that was the defense. Now the Texas game, the defense was the problem in that one. Actually, I, the offense came back. Yeah, just, but the they, offense started off. They didn't finish. 
Yeah, and it and, and they started very slow, and it kind of took. I'm not going to call it a fluke, but it took some out of character plays, like big time plays, to be made by like Philip Brooks and Keegan Johnson last year to yeah. put them in position to get things started. And yeah. so I would say this, like K State at quarterback, I think you're going to get more in those types of games from your quarterback this season than what you did Will Howard. Running back, it's not going to change a thing because DJ Giddens is going to continue to be a stud. Wide receiver, I think you're going to have better receiving options this year because they added Dante Cephas, which does seem like a good fit for K-State. And you would hope that, hey, Jace Brown is going to be a year older. Keegan Johnson has a year in. Maybe he's going to be healthy. Maybe there isn't as much expected of him now because Jace Brown was so good last year and Dante Cephas comes in and he's probably even more notable than what the Johnson edition was last season. But you're right. You do lose a playmaker like Benson at tight end, although they're very high on Garrett Oakley. And the offensive line will be a question. And all that plays into what the floor and ceiling of Avery Johnson will be next season. But what I will add on to this and, and what you know started getting me thinking about this, where you're talking about, hey, it's that first half of the, se- of the schedule next year where we're going to learn about Avery Johnson. Every level of football that Avery Johnson has played, he has been ready for the next step and he has passed the test flawlessly and I expect the same thing from him here like yes it's a different ball game going from high school football in Kansas to football in the big 12 but he accomplished that and yes it's a different ball game going from being the guy that comes in in either garbage time or with nothing to lose versus being the full-time starter and having to go out there for all 12 games and try and lead but it's just like when you and I were in school growing up. Like one day you're not a first grader anymore. You're a second grader and it doesn't feel like anything's changed for you because it's just school. And what you did in first grade prepared you for second grade and so on and so on. Like, look, high school to college, it seems like a big jump, but I didn't feel like, Oh man, this is way out of my, my ball game. When I got to college, it's because everything that I had done the last 12 years going to school prepared me for those four years in college and the next year of school like you just you're ready for the next test Avery Johnson is ready for the next test and every test he has taken prior to now he has passed and that's why I expect him to do it pretty darn close to flawless in 2024 and yes there there will no doubt be bad throws bad decisions bad games bad moments but I expect them to be very few and far between and I think he's going to come through more times than not for K-State uh, and I'm not overly worried about him having uh, a, a sophomore slump, if you want to call it that. What does help is you, you know, and you mentioned it, and it was a wise point to make is that it did feel like they were one play short against Texas. It felt like they were one play short against Missouri for sure, and Texas for sure. Heck, at by the end they were one play short against Oklahoma State because they had the ball. That, it was a one possession game, and they had the ball late. Right after even after that poor start, they had a chance, and then heck, the Iowa State game, right? Didn't they have a chance late? Even they did have the- a chance late. Yeah, no, they they had the ball and they were inside like the twenty. So yeah, so I mean, and you felt like all season and those losses. Now Iowa State, your defense just did you win, and yeah, Texas the start did you win, and then the defense did you win. The offense did make the comeback. Missouri, you just didn't make a play late. Um, both on both sides of the ball, really, in that one. And then uh, in the Oklahoma State, you came out really flat. Um, the defense kind of hunk- hunkered down to give the offense a chance. And, again, it just felt like you were one play short. You could make an argument. They're only one or two plays short, on and mostly on the offensive side of the ball, in all four of their losses. With how bad the defense was you know, against Iowa State, the offense could have still tied the game at the end. So, like – that's where Avery Johnson's a little bit different than Will Howard. I mean, Will Howard does have his pluses and negatives, right? But I wouldn't necessarily call him a playmaker. Yeah. I mean, Avery Johnson is a playmaker. So if you're talking about, you know, only being a player too short, he's the perfect guy to kind of quell that that issue. You I saw think the best way to put this real quick. The rushing, yeah. the rushing, the rushing touchdown against NC State in the bowl game where yeah. he made a bunch of guys miss, was that 20, 30-yard touchdown? That's that would be my example. Yeah. Look, I, I would phrase it like this. 
Will Howard is he's a game manager plus. When things are right around Will Howard, he can make really special things happen. Obviously, we saw that in the 2022 season when K-State won a Big 12 title, but that's because he had Deuce Vaughn and Ben Sennett and Malik Knowles. And like, you know, you can you can name even lesser guys that contributed on that offense, like Cade Warner, I would even throw out there because like yeah, they was explosive that year. They yeah. they had their roles and they were really good at them. And we saw seven. last year the production was less from receiver. DJ Giddens really good last season, but he's not Deuce Vaughn. He may maybe he'll get somewhat close to that. And I think he's really, really good. Like I'm not trying to diminish DJ Giddens, but he's not Deuce Vaughn. And we saw last year Will Howard was not as good. Now he wasn't terrible and bad like freshman and sophomore Will Howard. That that's a totally different guy. But He's a game manager plus. You give him the right tools, Will Howard can make things happen for you. You give him slightly less than ideal circumstances at time, he's he's not always going to come through. This is where Avery Johnson is going to be beneficial to K-State because Avery Johnson's talent with his arm and with his legs, that is not a game manager. Like you said, that is a playmaker. And you're going to have a playmaker for K-State with, I think, his go-to weapons as a whole having a higher ceiling than what the 2023 team had for Will Howard. Yeah. You have Dante C. I think, I think Dante Cephas is going to be at least solid. Mm -hmm. I think Keegan Johnson takes a step forward. I think we all do. I I think sometimes transfers have a hard time blending in and just taking off right away. I mean, can't say it's been kind of spoiled and that it hasn't always been that way, but the, but I think Keegan Johnson's going to be fine. Now you hope Dante Cephas doesn't have the same transition issue. Yeah. But the, Dante Cephas, Keegan Johnson, Chase Brown, I think from a just a pure talent perspective, I don't know that they've had a starting three as talented as those since I've covered the team. Um, you know, I guess 17 with Byron Pringle, Isaiah Harris, like that one's close. Shout out to my guy, Isaiah Harris. That one's close. Isaiah Harris did tail off that year. They had Dalton shown as well, I believe. So, I mean, 17 and 18, those those offenses, those receivers weren't bad, I guess. Um, especially 17, that group. Uh, so, but I don't know. I, I, I think I might still take this one. Now, we'll, we'll see how dumb I look. I don't know. Uh, but if Jaden Jackson's your number four, I think you feel – I mean, he was probably number three or number four last year. He probably will be again. Maybe he won't. Maybe Trace Bybee takes a jump. I just think now, they could still disappoint. Don't get me wrong. But I just think from a potential standpoint, ceiling potential standpoint, you're right about these wide receivers being a little bit better um, for Avery Johnson than what we've seen the last couple of years. Now, the the one that won the Big 12 title, that one's probably underrated, to be quite honest, because like you said, Cade Warner had a really good year. Yeah. And, and Malik Knowles – It'll make you pull your hair out. But I think he had a big season still. He had some big plays. Yeah. And, he, and he, you know, until he got hurt, was probably playing one of his best true games as a receiver for K-State in that Big 12 title where, I mean, the ball he caught downfield, I, that might be one of the best routes I've ever seen the K-State receiver run in some time. And then he had the end around that he got hurt on that, you know, benefited K-State greatly. So we'll see. But I, I think that, you know, expectations – for people when Avery Johnson got here were very, very high. And he did nothing last year to make you think that those, even as crazy as some people were with thinking like this guy is the savior, he really might just be that guy. And I, I, I tend to think that he is. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I, the way my mind works. I, and I, and I feel like I have to mention it as good as Malik Knowles was that year. And we both just highlighted that and, and said the pluses and stuff. The one thing that I'll remember him would be fumbling at the one yard line against Iowa State. Yeah, yeah. He, I mean, he's real fortunate that K State didn't lose that game, uh, and that I, I have been able to block that out. But yes, uh, good point. And uh, hopefully, uh, that's uh, a video that Jace Brown, Dante Cephas, and Keegan Johnson have seen and know. Uh, even yeah. when you are on the doorstep of scoring. Still protect the football because, man, I think you, you know how bad of a play memory that is in Kansas State history if they lose that game. Oh, yeah. I mean, because it's and they, they, don't get into the, they don't get into the Big 12 title game if they lose that because it would be Texas in there. 
So, right. And, yeah. they, and they only won by one point and it was 10 to nine. Yeah. That, that game had Malik Knowles fumbling at the one yard line, getting it popped out and, and Chris Tennant missed a field goal. So you had given four I'm, points away. I'm pretty sure Malik Knowles stat line looks amazing for that game too. I bet. Oh yeah. I, he, I think he's got like three catches for 87 yards or something like I thought uh, it was over a hundred. Yeah, it, it it may have been because I think he had another big catch uh, <laughs> in there as well. So yeah, uh, just to confirm for you on that. Uh, well, Phil Brooks had a nice day, one nineteen with a touchdown. He had that really long one. Uh, Malik Knowles in that game, yeah, five catches, one hundred eight yards. So how, like that would have been an all time Malik Knowles game if he just goes one yard further with that football. By by the way, I don't know that there was that many games where Malik Knowles and both Phil Brooks went. Both went over 100 yards, and somehow they still only scored 10 points. Yeah, that is that is pretty crazy. Uh, I mean, K State in that game, they racked <laughs> up 388 yards on offense and only scored 10 points. And they the and seven of them came on the first like the fourth play of the game. <laughs> so there had to be there had to have been another turnover turnover on downs too. But you mentioned uh, yeah. Let's see yeah. here. So they went touchdown, punt, punt, fumble. Uh, yep. yeah, that was, a, well, that was uh, Malik's fumble, right? Yeah, that was Malik's fumble and then punt, uh, and then punt, missed field goal, punt, field goal, punt, end of game. So, oh, just not a lot of possessions. Okay. Yeah. So wild, wild to look back on. And, uh, I don't, you know, s sorry that we turned something so good for people <laughs> talking about Avery Johnson into thinking about something so ugly, but Hey, the cats won the game and it helped them win a big 12 title. Uh, I guess let's end it there. Bring it full circle. It, is it out of is it crazy to think that the expectation should be for K-State to be in Arlington next year? I know it's going to get weird. You have so many teams, tiebreakers, yeah. schedules have to work out, but I mean, should we set the expectation for K-State to be playing in Arlington for a Big 12 title? No. I don't. Not in year 1 of a new starting quarterback. But I'll qualify it with this. You should be in the conversation in the last 2 weeks. Okay. That's what I would say. Because I, I think that's still a little steep for a guy that's never started a game it at is. even in his it, own stadium. <laughs> it, yeah, it, it's a good point. That That is a lot of pressure and expectation to be heaped onto somebody. And you think about what you have with, you know, guys that would be able to, you know, come back for another and year after thing. next year. Like, that. You, this sets up for 2025 to be yes. the year where K-State, I'll say it right now, given the circumstance, K-State has to win the Big 12 title in 2025. Or the Avery Johnson thing feels like a failure, and it, it may not be even be his fault. Like I'm not trying to say that, but it will feel like you wasted an opportunity, and that's probably wrong of me to be, you know, putting everything before we even get to 2025, and we still have 2024. Well, if, like to get pre mad about that, yeah. but I think that should just be on people's radar. Like the expectation yeah. is, you have Avery Johnson, you need to win at least one Big 12 title, and you're right. 2024 is an unfair expectation, so. If it doesn't happen then, then it has to happen in 2025. No, I understand the thought. I think that's it's it's a reasonable outlook. So no, I I can't I can't disagree. It's just like it's it's hard to say now because he's started one game and it was in, in Campy World Stadium in Orlando. So it's like yeah. Plus, yeah. we haven't even talked about it. Like a big, it, it could end up being a big deal. We'll see how it goes. But you're basically, I know you bring back Taylor Portier. Hadley Panzer, Carver Willis, but I mean, a lot of new faces on the offensive line. Yep. Good point. All things to consider, all things for us to worry about down the line. Right now, vibes are high for K State football, and we'll see what 2024 brings. So for Derek Young, I am Mason Voth. Thanks for watching and listening to K State Online. Head over to kstateonline.com. Make sure that you are signed up over there and a member of our great community. And as always, be sure to subscribe to the YouTube and podcast platforms. We are out of here. Thanks for watching and listening.